Mike Green, I'm here for Real Vision in Northern California. Behind me is a new map of Northern California with a shaking from the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989, which coincidentally is the time that my guest, Taylor Fravel, graduated from the same high school that I did. Uh, I graduated a little bit earlier than that, but Taylor, welcome to Real Vision. Great. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's absolutely a pleasure. So you and I have known each other for, you know, going on 30 plus years now. Uh, we actually played lacrosse together in high school. And we were reintroduced in 2014 because I heard about this brilliant MIT professor who gave a presentation to a group of hedge fund managers about the dynamics of security in the South China Sea. I think it actually may have been earlier than that. It might have been even be like 2011, 2012, now that I'm thinking back on it, because I was still at Canyon Partners at the time. And you came out and gave a presentation that literally just blew everyone's socks off. Um, and since then, I've followed your career. You've been one of the best thinkers about geopolitics in Southeast Asia or Asia in general. And I, I really wanted to bring you on to share with the Real Vision audience kind of how you're approaching the world, what you're thinking about in the dynamics between the U.S.-China relationship. And, and in particular, I want to spend some time thinking about Taiwan. But um, before we start there, can you fill everyone in now that they know you graduated from St. Ignatius in San Francisco? What happened next? Where did where did Taylor Fravel go next? Great. So actually, you know what, Mike? I, I never graduated from SI. When I was, uh, after my sophomore year, after after my stellar year on the lacrosse team, I think I was the most improved player. So that that's the award that goes You've to the You've got a long way to go, but yes. Okay, go ahead. Who tried <laughs> hardest. <laughs> so my father was actually uh, transferred by his company to Taiwan. So I went to, Ta I finished high school in Taiwan. I'm a graduate of the Taipei American School. Um, and from there, I ended up at uh, Middlebury College in Vermont uh, because I really wanted to learn how to speak Chinese, and they had a great uh, Chinese program. And after that, I was very fortunate enough to receive a scholarship uh, to go to Oxford. So I spent a couple of years in Oxford, uh, segued into management consulting for a few years with Bain & Company in San Francisco, and then ended up uh, at a PhD program uh, at Stanford in political science. Um, and then really I've been at MIT since receiving my PhD in uh, 2004. So that's actually a funny. I didn't even realize that you were at Bain. I was at Bain in Boston as well, um, although we didn't overlap by any, for any period of time. Um, so when you think about the world from the standpoint of being a, a academic, right? Now you've you've chosen an area of focus that obviously matches back with your history in terms of being stationed in Taiwan, having an experience growing up in Taiwan, learning the Chinese language. When you look at the time period that has elapsed since you and I were handsome young men and are now um, slightly less handsome, but still young men, um, how do you think about the development of U.S.-China relationships over that time period? Because right? it encompasses effectively the, the, the you know, true normalization starting in 1992. There's been substantive changes since then. Give us a sense of the arc of what's transpired. So that's really a good way of asking. So I would say the arc would be as follows. Um, you know, so spring of 1989 overlaps with the demonstrations and then massacre in Tiananmen Square, which I think for uh, most Americans uh, was a watershed moment in terms of how they thought about China, right? So up to that point, Deng was seen as this uh, really uh, promising reformer that China was opening up and becoming much more um, you know, liberal or, or perhaps like America. Um, in that sense, uh, and looking at the demonstrations, of course, in Tiananmen Square with the, the uh, goddess of democracy, which is a Statue of Liberty-like uh, sculpture uh, that was created by some of the art students. Of course, American views of China changed uh, pretty- Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. The uh, Goddess of Democracy, which is a Statue of Liberty-like uh, sculpture uh, that was created by some of the art students. Of course, American views of China changed uh, pretty dramatically. Um, and then they sort of 
I, I won't say they've certainly fully recovered to the to the the point at which they were say in the mid '80s, but um, China sort of dug itself out of isolation after uh, Tiananmen. Uh, sort of engagement with the global economy was a key part of that. Uh, uh, most favored nation trading status from the Clinton administration, ultimately by joining the, the WTO, and then really becoming the economic uh, juggernaut that it that it now is. But this certainly was not the case, right? China was still quite poor in 1989, relatively speaking. I had to look up, you know, the exact uh, numbers, but right, you know, GDP wise, it was it was not you know number two, right. even on a per capita basis, right? It was really quite poor. And, and now, of course, China is the world's, you know, second largest economy in aggregate terms, uh, you know, perhaps on a trajectory to close the gap with the United States. As an aside, I'm not a fan of, you know, PPP calculations when it comes to national security and power, because I think being able to convert your currency is hugely right, important part of that. Um, but we, that's a separate, you know, discussion we could have. So, you know, China is now this huge economic player, and um, it has interests around the world that didn't have in 1989. It has a military in particular today that didn't have in 1989 or even in 1999 or even in 2009, right? So from a from a hard power perspective, if one looks at wealth and one looks at military power, uh, China's position in the world has, uh, you know, a really changed uh, quite dramatically, such we're now back at a point, you know, not to, to bring the arc, you know, full circle, that Americans are certainly uh, much more concerned about China at any point since 1989, and perhaps at any point uh, since 1972. Uh, and, and so the relationship is really entering a new phase. Uh, it's going to be a very different phase than the one I just described, because it's really more about how the United States and the international uh, system more generally is going to accommodate a country with China's sort of heft and potential, um, uh, despite all the disagreements that's going to create or the points of friction that's going to create. And it will really be, I think, the, the you know, defining American uh, foreign policy challenge for the coming decade or two in terms of how to uh, come to grips with uh, China and how to sort of orient the U.S. policy in a way that uh, sort of upholds U.S. interests on the one hand and, and sort of prevents the most kind of catastrophic outcomes on the other hand, right? So I think there's a fine balance uh, to be struck here going forward. So when I when I think about a couple of points that you've brought in there, right? So in the mid 1980s, from an American perspective, and of course we were young, but we're very aware of the history, you know, China was perceived as exceptionally poor and there was an element of a paternal relationship that we had to a certain extent and helping them out of the extreme poverty, right? We engaged them under the Nixon administration in 1972, as you're referring to, largely as a check to the Soviet Union at that point, right? So we saw the opportunity post the Sino-Soviet conflict that emerged um, following uh, the break under Khrushchev, right? That created, um, you know, we, we had a relationship with them very similar to, you know, what we would have had with many countries in Africa, et cetera, where it was effectively pieces on a chessboard relative to, you um, uh, a, a deep relationship, right? There was very little economic integration at that point. In the 1990s, that began to change. And I would suggest, you know, you use the the identification of Tiananmen as, as a dip in that relationship, but really following that, starting roughly in 1992, I would suggest that the American Chamber of Commerce, right, the business relationships really began to explode. And particularly under the Clinton administration, that deepened, culminating with most favored uh, nation status and inclusion in the WTO as a still economically underdeveloped country that gave them all sorts of interesting access features to the U.S. markets. Um, and today, as you're pointing out, I would suggest that another change really happened in 2013 where China faced a choice, right? I mean, as I understand this, and I'm, I'm interested in your reaction to it, um, Xi Jinping, who came to power as effectively a not an unknown, but kind of a middle ground between two competing powers, two competing factions, that he was somewhat obsessed with the idea that the Soviet Union had had collapsed following the opening of their economy, saw some of the same challenges begin to develop with the CCP beginning to lose its grip on the economy. Um, and reoriented back towards a policy of centralization, government control, and that that is an inflection point that I don't think many people picked up on for an extended period of time. Um, does that feel fair in terms of identifying a few of the turning points there? That yeah, I, mean, I think the 2000 th turning point was more gradual, but that's basically it. I mean, Xi Jinping uh, comes into power, you know, apparently right after an attempt on his life. Right. <laughs> 
Um, disappeared. He disappeared for a two week period. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, depending upon you know what what sort of what I call room ins you want to read out of Hong Kong, but nevertheless, like quite true. And even if it wasn't an actual an attempt on his life, it was a, you know probably an attempt on his political life, right, to yep. knock him out of contention. And that also you know raised just questions about unity at the very top of the party um, because it was really kind of a cutthroat kind of political environment. So he comes in. I think he's got a number of concerns, but most of them revolve around. Um, Sort of recapitalizing and re-strengthening the party itself, which includes a whole set of you know domestic political uh, factors, but also uh, the economic factors that you just talked about. So the anti-corruption campaigns, which have been going on still, you know, more or less since she came into power, you know, had you know, probably two goals. One of which was to um, provide a, a platform by which his uh, political enemies could be removed uh, from uh, the, the chessboard, as it were, but also to try to to, to reinvigorate you know, party discipline, which I think, you know, if, if she was looking at the Soviet Union, it was not just sort of the opening of the economy, but the fact that just the party itself sort of had lost discipline and um, had sort of lost its way. And so you see a lot of what she has been doing and some of the ways in which she kind of uh, sort of tries to evoke Mao or earlier periods in the party's history is to really re, re, re-strengthen and anchor the party uh, because he sees that as critical uh, to China's future. That in turn, right, leads to a, a desire certainly not to let go of any more of the economy. Um, and I think, you know, I think the state-owned sector sort of share of GDP in China is more or less the same. But as uh, Andrew Batson mentioned recently, right, the, China's GDP has grown a lot, so I, like, like the state sector. it's not standing still. And then you've got, you know, the, the, the non-state sectors, but as we've seen uh, really in the last six years, the pretty pointed efforts, whether it's HNA, Anbang, perhaps most recently Jack Ma and financial, right, to, to sort of signal that, that there are limits to what uh, these private entities can do, even if they're really quite powerful. Um, and so that's a sort of an indirect way to kind of keep these these not you know they're not state-owned enterprises but they're you know they certainly have their their ties to the party and to the state but to keep them kind of moving in the direction that that the party wants them to go in uh, and not becoming you know ultimately alternative uh, sources of power right that could challenge either she or challenge the party more generally so he's really like a you know to harken back to the Qing dynasty a state strengthener but in this case it's a party strengthener because it's the mm-hmm. party state that is really what anchors uh, China right as a political actor. And so from my perspective, if I'm thinking about the Soviet Union in that context, right, it's very similar to the transition actually from Lenin to Stalin, effectively, right? So, so Lenin had gone in with the best of intentions to bring the you know, socialist worker utopia and had recognized that the challenges associated with that, particularly coming from the very low level that the Soviet Union was, was creating conditions of famine, starvation, et cetera, had introduced the new economic principles which carried roughly through 1929. And then under Stalin, as Stalin took power, the role of the private sector was rolled back, foreign investment was reduced, and the party was given control, more accurately, the party in the personage of Stalin, right? So the same sort of anti-corruption purges, et cetera, which are really just a mechanism for centralizing control in an individual as compared to even the party or to think about it more broadly as a nation. Right. Does that, does that feel fair that, that that's a reasonable analogy? Maybe not a direct comparison, but analogy? Yeah, I, I would say not a direct comparison given kind of the economic disasters, right, that Stalin created. And I think China's pretty intent on avoiding those, uh, but certainly in, in the sense of reconsolidating the party um, and, and thinking about how to govern in a new period, right, this is the challenge um, that, that China faces. And one other thing I would say, or that the party faces, uh, with the comparison to the Soviet Union, um, you know, another element in the Soviet collapse was simply the massive uh, burden uh, the defense sector placed on the Soviet economy. Uh, and so one other lesson that China has also tried to draw is how to balance basically spending on defense with uh, spending on other areas and not let defense um, basically cut, you know, sort of grow out of control such that they actually don't have you know, a vital economy and industrial base and innovation sector that they want to have in terms of kind of achieving their broader economic goals. So I think that's actually a really important place to segue. Um, I mean, first, the Soviet Union, many of the economic disasters that you refer to 
you know, were exacerbated by the conditions of the Great Depression, right? So it's difficult, obviously, to draw any form of direct comparison. China, post-2009, engaged in very aggressive stimulus, but more importantly, was able to capture a growing share of global trade, particularly in manufactured goods, um, and that has underpinned a lot of the success, right? They have become the, the most important trading partner for a sizable fraction. And certainly in the environment of a coronavirus shutdown of the U.S. economy, we've seen how dependent we have actually become upon for China in terms of our supply chains, et cetera, yeah. right? And that level of integration never really existed with the Soviet Union. No, I mean, it was, I mean, it wasn't like, Isol completely isolated economically, but there is no integration. Like if the Soviet economy, well, well, the Soviet economy did collapse in the 80s and like that had no impact on the United States. <laughs> I mean, it had a positive strategic effect, but it wasn't, it had no economic, you know, kind of after, you know, blowback or consequences. Right, unless you happen to be working for the military in 1989, post the Soviet collapse, it, it had no negative impact, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, if we look at you know, defense consolidation of the 90s in the US, absolutely. But, right. but like in general, like in terms of American, like welfare and, you know, um, uh, in that sense, I think it's, yeah, it's very different. Yeah. When you think about what you were just referring to, China, th this is an important topic in my mind, how China balances the economic vitality with their increasing strategic objectives to change their current positioning. Right. So I had wanted to hold off on this, but I can't. My excitement is so tangible on this point. Um, you have a brilliant chart that you've constructed or picture that you've constructed um, that is akin to the famous New Yorker cartoon, how a New Yorker sees the world, right? And so we're gonna bring in this graphic and I just wanna orient people to this. So first, you know, this is kind of how we see China on Google Earth, right? Which is this idea that it's a large landmass. It is not a continental power as in the same way that the United States is. It doesn't span the continent and it doesn't have full access to the oceans on either side, but it has access to the Pacific Ocean. It is a sizable land power. And yet that's not how China sees itself, which is what you've done here. And so if we rotate that same graph, all of a sudden that picture looks very, very different. And so here we're looking at the perspective of Beijing looking out. And instead of the Pacific Ocean, you see barrier islands, you see Japan, you see a relation, you see, you know, a peninsula, Korea, where South Korea is allied with the West. You see the Philippines, you see Taiwan, you see Okinawa, et cetera, right? And on most of those, there is either a US military presence or the capacity to rapidly deploy through an, an alliance, a US military presence. What does this mean to China? How does China think about this? Why is this picture so important? So I think it's important for a couple of reasons. Um, and sort of one point of context, right? Just because I, li I like that you brought in the United States. And so, you know, when I often talk about Chinese uh, sort of strategic thinking, uh, I sort of say we need a palate cleanser in the beginning, which is just to say, look at the map. And so this is actually the second map I show, but if we just look at our, the first map of China, right, you see that China has 14 neighbors on land uh, and the United States has two, right? So China has a really complex kind of continental environment, um, right? Four of these countries have nuclear weapons, Korea, Russia, Pakistan, and India, many of them have large militaries, Russia and India in particular, also North Korea, although not nearly as effective. Uh, and there are also you know, these potential for failed states or failing states, uh, some of the Central Asian republics from time to time, North Korea. So it's just like China has this kind of really complex environment. And so if it's looking, you know, it wants to sort of prevent the formation of counterbalancing coalitions, but it also wants to be able to have, you know, more security and more buffers, right? So on land, it's been able to create buffers in part by improving political relationships with its neighbors, in part because uh, a lot of the Chinese population lives uh, closer to the coast and on the interior areas. Um, and 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 apart by the basically the collapse of the Soviet Union, right, which which relieved kind of strategic pressure from the north. Um, and now, of course, and we could talk about later the sort of a Russia kind of China relationship today. But when China looks um, to the maritime direction, or you know, it has to look east or southeast, right? Either directly into the Western Pacific through the East China Sea or uh, south into the South China Sea. And it has what you know the Ch Chinese analysts call the first island chain. But it's not just the first island chain because, as you know, right, 
the Korean Peninsula is, is not commonly viewed as the island chain, but but of course it, it is viewed as as a traditional invasion route into China uh, and sort of served that function in the past. And so it's a very important area for China uh, to be able to uh, uh, probably ultimately dominate or at least be able to shape sort of outcomes uh, toward uh, when, when when international events happen there, which gets us to perhaps why China does continue to support North Korea, uh, even when it, it doesn't seem like it ought to or it should. And then, so you have Japan, uh, the four home islands, the Ryukyu Island chain, Taiwan, and you know the Philippines, and it's just sort of one continuous belt. And I think China views that as kind of a, a, a line that hems it in, right? Because if Chinese vessels want to enter into the Western Pacific, they have to go through a variety of, you know, if Chinese vessels want to enter the Pacific from their Northern fleet or their East Sea fleet, they basically have to go through the Japan home islands uh, or, or different straits that Japan has identified as transit straits, um, which could, you know, in, in under certain conditions be closed. I'm not sure Japan would you know, want to close them in normal times, but in, in, in non-normal, you know, if, if there was a real crisis, that, that access could be could be limited. Uh, and the same, in, even in the South China Sea, if one is thinking uh, that is sort of, you know, the natural gateway into the Indian Ocean and ultimately the Persian Gulf, right, there are a lot of choke points uh, that China has to contend with. Now, there are ways in which, you know, Chinese vessels, even if the Malacca Straits were closed, could navigate through other uh, sort of parts of the Indonesian island chain, but it doesn't necessarily give I think a country with the sort of geopolitical heft as China and kind of the positioning as China necessarily a lot of confidence or sense of security, right, that it can access the oceans. And of course, uh, the oceans are a really important part of its uh, security today, given that it is a very active uh, trading country and increasingly becoming integrated with uh, other regions of the world. And most of that is still happening you know, on the water. Uh, and then if we look at these countries again, right, the United States, as you mentioned, right, is present uh, quite significantly in South Korea and in Japan, um, including uh, the base in Okinawa, but really you know, the, the very strong alliance relationship between the United States and Japan. Um, Taiwan, of course, is not a, a formal ally of the United States. The U.S. has commitments to Taiwan under the uh, Taiwan Relations Act, uh, but but certainly it is also not a territory that is, be, is under Chinese control. And so in that sense, it can't be used as, as a way of kind of projecting power directly into the Western Pacific. And then the Philippines, which, you know, recently in, under President Duterte has you know, I think moved away from a much stronger tilt towards the United States that we saw under the Aquino administration uh, to perhaps more of an equidistance point or even a little closer to China. Uh, and, and occasionally, you know, Duterte will talk about uh, abrogating the visiting forces agreements and really trying to perhaps throw out American uh, soldiers, uh, you know, troops for a second time. But, but, but as we were uh, discussing a little bit before uh, the call started, before we started taping that, um, right, there's gonna be an, an election in the Philippines in, in about a year and a half, and, and we don't know who will replace Duterte, but it's, it's highly likely given that the existence of the treaty, al tre treaty alliance uh, between the Philippines and the United States, as well as some other agreements that have been signed more recently, that you could see a return of even more US forces uh, to that part of uh, China's periphery. And so China really has to think about, you know, just to, to sum up, right, balancing different regions, both on land and at sea. Um, China has to think about preventing uh, the formation of counterbalancing coalitions, which could come uh, from its perspective, at least in a negative way, from multiple directions, including from the sea as well as from land. And so it really wants to try to maximize as much as it can its freedom of maneuver in the region and to be able to sort of overcome uh, this barrier that, that in effect, this island chain and the Korean Peninsula has sort of put in place. I think you've, you brought up, obviously, a lot of really, really important points there. Um, the first, and it's one that I continually emphasize, which is this, there's a dynamic of geography that really matters, right? So China has 14 land neighbors, the U.S. has two. Those two are, well, occasionally fractious relationships in only the most, you know, uh, loose form right. uh, of, of the description, they are functionally captured by the United States, right? At, at the end of the day, while Canada may occasionally object to, to how we behave, they understand that, that we are the critical relationship, right? Um, Mexico as well. And in a weird way, they provide buffers for us. Mexico, you know, obviously is a filtration point for Southern, you know, South American influences. And Canada is, you know, protecting our great white North is kind of the easiest way to think about it. And then on either side, we've got the world's best moats, right? The Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. And messing with the United States is incredibly difficult, right? I mean, to mount a sustained attack on the United States is almost unfathomable. China doesn't have that luxury, right? They've got 
interactions with India, they've got interactions with Korea, they've got interactions with Russia, as you point out. And broadly, that falls under the camp of what's referred to as McKinder Global Theory, where the idea is that there, that Eurasia is a single continent, it is a world power continent, and none of the players on that continent um, have stable relationships, right? And so when you see Russia and China enter into a strategic relationship as they have done, the question becomes why? What are they trying to accomplish? And I think you and I both kind of look at it and say, well, this is a marriage of convenience where they're effectively trying to reduce US influence in the region. Does that feel fair in, in an assessment? Yeah, I think I think absolutely, right? I mean, on the one hand, there's no love lost between China and Russia if you look at their history. Yep. Right? I mean, there was a second Cold War we never talk about, which is the Cold War from you know the early 60s to the late 80s between China and Russia in the Soviet Union. Uh, it was you know a quarter of Soviet ground forces were deployed against China. Right, the stuff we just never talk about today. Uh, they, they they clashed over Damansky Island. One of the only times new, two nuclear armed powers have engaged in conventional combat with each other. Although China's force was quite, you know, small. I mean, it, it wasn't even clear how deployable their weapons were. But yeah, I don't, you know, it, it's still, you know, a, a not tr non-trivial risk to today, where it, where um, despite I think a lot of Russian anxiety about Chinese influence in the Far East, right? You have a very strong political relationship between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, and I, I think it really it really started perhaps just to, you know, as any kind of alignment does in international politics, to sort of combine forces to kind of immunize themselves as much as possible from U.S. Uh, influence where they didn't want it to, 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 you know, to be influenced or to, to be exercised on them. And now more generally, I, I wouldn't necessarily go so far as to say it's it, it's designed to sort of push the U.S. out of Eurasia entirely, but it's certainly designed to limit the ability of the U.S. Uh, in Eurasia uh, to kind of impose its will on either one of those two countries. And so it's very important in this sense, I think, because they share a long land border and are now closely aligned, they can really orient themselves strategically in the directions to which they want to be focused. So China, you know, Maritime Asia, um, principally, uh, and then Russia, perhaps, you know, um, towards Eastern and you know, Central Europe. Uh, and because they don't have to worry about uh, contesting that belt or that zone between them and Mongolia in particular, which kind of became a flashpoint in, in, in that Cold War, uh, I think it, 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 it's you know, an important sort of shift in international politics. How enduring will it be? I'm a bit of a skeptic because I think that it wasn't, you know, they weren't brought together by shared values, except perhaps in kind of strongman rule. Uh, they weren't brought together by any deep cultural bonds or, you know, and there's a, like a lot of latent kind of, you know, racism in, in Russian approaches or views of China that you find in not in official sources, but in a lot of unofficial sources. So it's probably a, a relatively uh, sort of thin level of alignment, but nevertheless um, still consequential because as the U.S. relationship with uh, the United States worsens and has worsened in the last you know, five to eight years, that, that has coincided with the strengthening of the China-Russia relationship. At the same time, I, I, I think you would see a similar dynamic in terms of the Russia kind of, you know, Russia's own relationship with the West at large to include the United States. Well, and, and so one of my pet theories is that the best player in this game is Putin by far. Mm -hmm. um, and I look at the relationship as Russia effectively replaying the dynamics of the Molotov-Ribbentrop protocol, right? Effectively choosing to partner with somebody where you know it's an unstable relationship, right? And so Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of the Soviet Union, it was caused effectively by Stalin being ready to defect to the West. Right. Effectively, he would traveled to Vladivostok to meet with Roosevelt and the underlying dynamic was that the Soviet Union was going to flip. And so Hitler was forced into a um, aggressive land grab, effectively trying to overthrow the Soviet Union before the forces could be aligned against him is is the dynamic that I think about. I'm suspicious that the same thing is in play here. Right. Because China can't actually or Russia can't allow China to become a true global hegemon. It cannot allow it to share that land border, particularly in Asia, with a power that is remotely as close to the United States as China is beginning to approach. And so I'm, I'm actually quite suspicious that this is a move from Putin 
get the Chinese to overextend themselves, break the relationship with the United States, and then flip, and China become or Russia becomes a natural ally of the United States in, in again containing China in the same way that China played that role in the um, U.S. Soviet relationships in the 1970s to the late 1980s. Reaction. Interesting. I hadn't thought about that. My initial take is that that um, which is not necessarily direct reaction to to, to your um, assessment is that you know economically, right? Russia has had real need for China, especially as it has been cut off from the West, and it's sort of a petro state. Right. I mean, this is more your area than mine, but not a really robust, developed, diversified economy. Uh, and and sort of what seemed to sort of cement the deal was when Russia finally agreed to, you know, uh, grant uh, or, or sell China, you know, gas and, and, and other hydrocarbons at pretty good prices that they had resisted doing for you know a decade or more. Because yep. China was the natural market for everything, you know, from Siberia east. Uh, and so it's, it may still be that was Putin's calculations that he could get China to take kind of the flack from the United States and, and protect his own country. But I think he also had real reasons for needing to, to move closer to China. But the, the converse is that China has, at least so far, really or it has tried to hide behind Russia in many ways, especially in security issues outside of Asia. And so if one looks at the intervention in Syria uh, or other uh, UN related interventions, China will go along and veto or abstain if Russia does, but it, it never is the one leading the veto or the abstention. It, all, it always allows Russia to do this, which I think actually complicates uh, Russia's relationship with the rest. I think these are areas, say Syria, where either Russia believes it has more, has stronger interests than China, or it sees it as an opportunity uh, to sort of sort of widen the Soviet sphere. It's not an area particularly where China wants wants to play or be present. I think, you know. China has its own experience with revolution and knows it's not something one really wants to get deeply involved in, whereas Russia, whether it's you know Chechnya or elsewhere, seems to get more drawn into these. So, so I am not so sure if, if that is Putin's intention, it, it, it will necessarily be successful. Because I think China has, has pretty carefully modulated that relationship, at least outside of Asia, uh, such that um, whenever there is criticism of, of, of you know, to go back to Syria again, right? That often gets leveled at Russia first, uh, even though China in the UN, right, is, is providing important diplomatic support to Russia so that it's not just one country between. But there's no instance in the UN where China has, I think, uh, I may be wrong. If I am, apologies to your listeners. There, there's nothing that I can think of where China has vetoed the UN Security Council resolution that wasn't over, that didn't involve Taiwan, right? It's, you know, core interest. Uh, um, alone, right? So China always looks for kind of partners here as kind of a way to kind of uh, signal to the U.S. that there are limits to to at least China's acceptance of uh, certain uh, policies it would view as too interventionist, uh, however you want to describe it. And so I, I am not sure that China will be, Putin will be able to put China in the position that he wants, uh, because I'm not sure that he has uh, necessarily uh, the ability uh, to do that. It may be the case that for reasons independent of the Russia-China entente that um, US-China uh, relations deteriorate to a point where from a US perspective, cooperation with Russia is quite valuable. Um, no. And, and, and um, Russia may conclude that China is at that point so strong that it wants, again, to be able to put pressure on sort of the, the northern or on China's northern border, and you have some kind of, you know, a, a, as you said, um, you know, 1972 uh, Nixon in China. I guess is it right. Biden to right. Biden to Moscow? Maybe it's after Biden. Probably, I don't know. probably Harris to Moscow, but Harris yeah. to Moscow uh, moment. So it's possible. I, I think the U.S.-China relationship would have to get a lot worse before the U.S. would want to do that, because at least our current, you know, policy orientation is one of viewing both Russia and China as equal. Um, not equal, but as both, both bad, actor. yeah. great, bad actors, great power competition, yeah. which, you know, in some ways we have, you know, that, that policy orientation has helped push them together uh, mm -hmm. and kind of keeps them together. So, so it's interesting. I guess, I guess I won't go so far as to endorse it, but I'll say it's something I need to, I, I need to think more about. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, it's kind of my base case that ultimately that Russia, first of all, I think Putin is, is the best player in the game. Right. And if I'm Russia, I'm doing everything I possibly can to position myself to horse trade Syria and Turkey um, and effectively access to the Mediterranean for 
hemming in China at some point in the future, right? The other thing that you mentioned is this idea of balancing economic power with military power. Mm -hmm. And this is an area that I've done some work in as well. And, and I would highlight the dynamics of the importance of demographics here, right? So China is currently fielding approximately 2 million people in its military, if I understand correctly. A typical force multiplier in terms of the logistics chains that are required to support that is about 10x, right? So there's probably 20 million people in one form or another out of China's labor force that are involved in the support of its existing military. And that's without having a deep water Navy, that's without having foreign bases of any significant quantity. They've got Djibouti, but you know, realistically, there's not that much that's out there. They are in all likelihood developing components in Sri Lanka, et cetera. They currently don't have the same sort of force projection that the US has. And they're already at 2 million people with a probable support ratio of about 20 million. If I do the math on the demographics of that, and I think about those components largely in the context of young men, right? Um, and typically in the 15 to 40 range, because it's going to require a variety of components of flexibility, et cetera. That population within China is collapsing over the next 15 to 20 years, right? So it's currently men, young men, 15 to 40 years old, I believe is about 200 million currently in China. That number falls to about 150 million over the next 15 years. And if I think about the implications, right? So if I've got 20 million today and I wanna expand my military, let's say to 3 million, therefore I've now got 30 million allocated to it. At 200 million, that means I've got 180 million people who can work in the remainder of the economic sphere to provide robustness and vibrancy. But if that drops to 150 and I've got 30, now I've almost cut in half my economic potential outside of that. What would your reaction be to that assessment? I think the demographic challenges for China, right, as a global power are, are real and ones perhaps we don't talk enough about because wh whatever projection you look at, right, China's not going to get more populous, right? It's going right. to it's going to decline. The question is, at what rate does it decline? Um, and then how does this impact different segments of society? Uh, like you're pointing out. I don't think that that for a separate reason, I don't think China wants its military to grow in size. In fact, I I wouldn't be surprised if it downsizes its military further. So the, the reforms that Xi Jinping put in place in the December 29th of 2015, or early 2016, uh, but because I'm an academic, I have to be accurate. So I have to say it's the late 2015 reforms, right? Cut the PLA by 300,000. Previously, John Zeman had cut them by 700,000. And at the height of, of, of the Sino-Soviet standoff, right, they were at about 6 million. So we've gone from a PLA of 6 million down to 2 million. And I think they they probably would like to get that to an even smaller number, um, which is to say that uh, they are thinking about obviously uh, developing and projecting military power in a different way than before. They want to try to leverage as much uh, you know, informatization uh, as the Chinese call it, or information technology, as well as what's uh, sometimes uh, discussed um, in this context is military civil fusion, uh, which has uh, perhaps more uh, relevance to uh, the innovation sector. But I think China is also thinking very hard about how it could have sort of dual use aspects of its uh, society and its economy in particular so that I, your logistics multiplier can be reduced. And I, I would have to think more about that multiplier in a Chinese context. So perhaps later we can talk more about that and sort of where that comes from. I'm not, that seems a little high for me in a Chinese context, but you know, be that as it may, it's a good number to work with. Uh, but but what, what you see, right, is this effort to really make the, the PLA much more efficient than before. And they're only sort of halfway there. So one of the recent uh, reforms was, was to create a joint logistics department. And you know, logistics, right, is boring. It's not military hardware. It's not war fighting. Uh, but obviously, logistics is what, you know, as we know from Napoleon, right? I was, was going to say, speak for yourself. I was an operations research major in college, so uh, along with finance. So I, I, I love logistics. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of us might love it more than others, but no. whether we love it or not, we have to we have to uh, respect it greatly. Yes, correct. <laughs> and so, I think what you see China doing um, is thinking about uh, sorry, in 2000, these late these reforms in late 2015 set up for the first time a joint logistics uh, department. Um, so previously, right, logistics in China was one, run through geographically defined military regions along a very old Soviet territorial defense model. Mm -hmm. Right, which meant that you you had different 
purchasing and supply chains for different parts of China, not one unified uh, supply. So they've only begun to unify that quite recently. Uh, and that, of course, will take a long time, or at least probably a decade, to, to make much more efficient. Taking a step back, but what this means is uh, the PLA is not going to, you know, uh, I mean, it, it, faces, it, it faces economic reality in terms of how big it could be, right? It faces constraints. Uh, some of these are going to be population-oriented constraints. Some of them will be economic constraints that are linked to the population. But if we think about China becoming a global military power, and this is a distinction I try to draw for people, right? China says it wants to become a world-class military, which means they want to be best in class, as good as anybody else. That's kind of what if we were to translate that term into Chinese, it would mean. But it does not mean necessarily they also want to be a global military, at least with the footprint of the United States, um, right? Because that's a different sort of sense of world. And that requires exactly what you pointed out, right? What makes the United States a global military power? Right? It's not just that we have you know, maybe the best technology, the best ships, and the best airplane. I mean, the F-35 is a great airplane, um, right? Uh, but what makes us a global military power is that we're in 40 countries and we have mil you know, 800 military installations in 40 countries around the world. Um, and, that, and, and that means we, we as a country can forward, forward deploy a lot of forces, which means we can react even simultaneously in different parts of the world. And that, that's really what, uh, you know, and the corresponding so-called command of the commons, I think is really what anchors America's sort of global military posture and global military role. And that was built in the aftermath of the Second World War and the acceleration of competition with the Soviet Union, but under a, a unique set of historical circumstances. And so China's coming in, it has global interests, it would even like to perhaps use military power to address some of those interests, perhaps not in a war fighting way, but in other ways in other regions around the world, but is really very slowly developing that global uh, military presence, uh, which is another constraint on, I think, the, the, the sort of military power they will be able to project uh, in the future. So you mentioned the base in Djibouti, which yep. I don't know, 2017 is when it opened, but talked about earlier, but we haven't yet really seen all of their mutually reinforcing points. And you know, there may be something in Sri Lanka at some point, there may be something in Pakistan at some point. I'm old enough to remember the Booz Allen study uh, of the so-called string of pearls, which showed all the ports where China was, which is a 20 year old report now. So th these are ideas that have been there for a while, but that China hasn't really pushed on too hard. And there are political reasons, I think, why they haven't pushed too hard. Um, but there are also other reasons, which is to say that their most, their pressing security concerns are still in Asia. Uh, so the last point I would make uh, in terms of your, your, your good insight about logistics would be, Another thing that separates the Chinese military from the U.S. military is that it's, China is still very much playing a home game, right? So, so, so uh, China's main contingencies are on its immediate periphery relating to its sovereignty, especially Taiwan that we've talked about, India, which has been in the news in the last year, South China Sea, and then the you know, a lot of these have a maritime component. So there's a huge maritime component to China's approach, but everything is, for the most part, except for the three. Um, you know, new bases that have been built on these artificial islands in the South China Sea, Chinese forces are, are still based all on homeland territory, all on the mainland or on Hainan Island. That does give it an advantage, right? It gives it an advantage for any conflict in the region because it's, it's going to be close to all of its stockpiles. It doesn't need, like, the United States to project power across the Pacific or to surge forces at great distance, which the U.S. can do, but it can't do it overnight, right? Um, we saw in the buildup to to you know, the um, 2003 uh, Iraq war uh, took a while like, to put troops in place to be able to execute that. Uh, China is gonna be closer to its uh, strategic stockpiles and it has been sort of pretty aggressively filling, especially whenever oil prices kind of you know, plummet, right? China adds, adds more and more to its stockpiles. And so it, it, it can reduce some of the logistical burden, which is uh, the point I wanna make because it is, it is kind of operating on its homeland, fighting in some ways, or logistically, it's on you know so-called interior lines, right? So it's easier, you know, to move um, move your forces or move supplies on the interior, and that does that. I think counteracts a little bit, at least, some of the the costs that we'll have to pay to um, to be able to sustain this force. But they're they're very actively thinking about how to you know leverage information technology and automation, and everything else, to be able to reduce to reduce that burden uh, more generally. So that's actually, I think, a really, really good point. It's candidly one that I hadn't fully thought about, which is the, 
the dynamic that their logistics multiplier is probably significantly less than the United States because their supply chains are not nearly as extended, right? So they don't have to manage across 40 different countries. And so that may obviate some components of it. I'm still skeptical that the demographic features that I described, like it is going to become increasingly difficult for them to balance that military force with the economic projection. And I'm sympathetic to your point on the restructuring of the PLA, although I would suggest that that was more of a corruption, you know, quote unquote, corruption purge, you know, realigning the forces of loyal uh, of loyalty to Xi um, and the consolidation of the logistics feature is basically a way of reducing the number of people that keep put their hands in the pot to develop independent sources of wealth, right? The I often refer to the Roman Empire dynamics. Effectively, it stripped a number of generals and admirals of their ability to fund and pay um, various uh, corruption chains, shall we say. If I can jump in here, then I'll let you finish. So so absolutely, right? There's a huge anti-corruption component. And and the most corrupt parts of the PLA are in logistics and, you know, because that's where all the the, the fat can be skimmed, uh, you know. You know, um, oh, I'm gonna, you know, I've got a contract to build barracks here, and uh, I'm supposed to build, you know, uh, barracks for a thousand people. Um, I built for 500 and keep the rest. Uh, I mean, all of those stories are very common, but I don't want to downplay the reform from a war fighting perspective. Uh, which is to say, I think two things were happening. At least two things were uh, being, or two goals were being pursued in in the reforms. And one clearly was to to root out corruption or to at least uh, suppress it uh, in these systems it can't be rooted out right that's impossible given the nature of the systems um but but to suppress it um and to really sort of have the pla be focused on um on war fighting and not simply as an interest group for which it would sort of uh, take its share of, of sort of state revenue but on the other hand when they thought about how to reorient it right by they transitioned from military regions to theater commands which was a, for the first time allowed them to set up joint commands inside China, which is a huge change. Uh, and more generally, they divided kind of the development of, of armed forces through the services, through the, the use of force, through these theater commands and centralized it very high in the Central Military Commission. So there was clearly a pretty strong um, operational uh, objective being pursued as well, because the PLA had realized really since the Gulf War in the early 90s that joint operations were uh, the ways and was the way in which you would sort of project and exercise military power in the future. Uh, but of course, being a ground force dominant, you know, people's liberation army, uh, they had no joint operations capability. Uh, and they've really spent the last 25 years figuring out what that means and figuring out how to sort of reform their institutions to be able to um, conduct those kinds of operations, except they're still just focused on their periphery, right? These, these are joint operations within 200 you know, miles of China, roughly, um, right. or whatever the bubble of air, you know, of air cover is, because yep. you wouldn't want to be a, a, a destroyer, you know, a thousand miles from China, right. Uh, right. just with your shipborne air defenses, that would be a pretty vulnerable position to be in. Yeah, no, I, I think that's very, I think that's very clear. And I, I appreciate the clarification. That's useful to understand the operational component as well as the political dynamic um, yeah. associated with it. That gives us a good opportunity. You mentioned 200 miles. That gives us a good opportunity to begin to reorient to the issue of Taiwan, right? So now we're back in that first island chain. And the, the critical question for me is, what is the timing? And how do we think about Taiwan in terms of the incentive structure for Xi to move sooner rather than later towards a Taiwan reintegration, right? Mm -hmm. So in 20. 18, 2019, I believe, Xi began to refer to 2021 as the time period in which he wanted Taiwan to be reintegrated. Now, you know, whether that is historical speaking, you know, looking at an environment projecting forward two years in the same way that, you know, I always say, you know, I'm going to become physically fit in the next two years, right? Um, the, um, or whether that was an actual legitimate observation. We also have had Xi exhort the military to be, you know, battle prepared, to be, to prepare for war, right? Um, one of the famous expressions from the Trump administration in the United States is people took him literally, but not seriously, right? Is there an issue with Xi where we're not taking him seriously or literally when he says these things, right? That we're effectively projecting, well, he would never do that sort of thing. 
onto it. Do you think there is a risk that they move sooner rather than later against Taiwan? My assessment is that there is not much of a risk um, that they would move sooner rather than later, which is not to say that they wouldn't move at some point. But those, right. are, that those are two different um, propositions. Uh, so just to take a, a step back on, on the two points you mentioned, right? There's been uh, surely a, a hardening of China's Taiwan policy in the last five years, yep. uh, stripping away some of these ally, these states that still rec you know, formally recognize Taiwan as, as the Republic of China. So I think Taiwan's down to 15 countries that recognize its sovereignty versus uh, mainland sovereignty. Um, and a lot of this accelerated after uh, Tsai Ing-wen was elected as president once Ma Ying-jeou completed his two terms because she wouldn't bend the knee and utter the words, you know, 1992 consensus, which is what China wanted to hear uh, to sort of be reassured that uh, Taiwan would not sort of drift uh, sort of towards formal independence. And then in January 2019, she does give this very tough speech, although I didn't read it as setting any kind of deadline for uh, 2021. So I'll have to go back and, and take another look at that. Um, because even when Chinese leaders talk a little bit about urgency or deadlines, they, they tend to project them very far out into the future. So they can't be the one to fail to um, uh, achieve anything by that deadline in this or, the, or be criticized uh, for uh, failure to do so. And so there is a hardening line. This has an interactive effect with the United States, right, which has adopted its own uh, sort of increased, you know, hardened its support for Taiwan in the last 12 months, particularly in the last nine months, uh, including very high profile visits uh, this past summer um, you know, with a cabinet a level um, uh, uh, individual of uh, the, the Secretary of Health and Human Services and then later the Under Secretary of State. And actually in January, you know, the UN ambassador was scheduled, the US ambassador to the UN was scheduled to go to Taiwan. And it's only after um, you know, the, the siege of the capital on, on January 6th, that was actually stopped. And so um, it was sort of going to be a, a we had a sort of growing kind of U.S. support in a way that was really I think, designed in part to to um, raise questions in, in, in China's mind about, you know, whether or not the U.S. still had a one China policy, um, which to me was a quite worrisome development because China's China's assessment of whether or not the U.S will abide by what China believes to be the central commitments in the 72 and 79 communiques are, are, one, are one aspect of US-China policy that really shapes how they think about Taiwan much more than anything else. And that's come under uh, pressure. Um, but you know, I think China's general approach to Taiwan right, is to use military power uh, coercively in a psychological sense, right, to really um, uh, sort of uh, signal to Taiwan that that there would be true costs if it did pursue independence, if it did basically cross on one of the mainland's red lines. But I don't see them as seeking to bring about, uh, much less through force, um, a unification in, in you know, a one or two year period. The only, there's only one real way I think they could do that, which would be an amphibious assault uh, because Taiwan would be able to resist coercion short of that. And uh, coercion short of that would also play out over a longer period of time, which would allow uh, other states to mobilize to support Taiwan. So China's kind of caught between a rock and a hard place in the sense it wants to use more military power, but to use it directly to, to bring about a change in Taiwan uh, is, is a pretty large scale operation. So it does think about military power in this coercive sense, which is really more of deterring uh, are continuing to, der to deter Taiwan, Taiwan's aspirations for independence as opposed to the short-term coercing uh, unification because that's just a very uh, difficult challenge. So then to go into Xi Jinping's comments about a strong army and being able to fight and win wars, my general take on that rhetoric, which has been around for a while, it actually goes back to early 2013 when she first started talking about this uh, idea of a strong army, the what do you call it, the Changjian Mu Biao, and to be, to be able to fight and win. And usually when you have leaders talking about being able to fight and win, they're either doing it because they're preparing to go and they want to kind of prepare society for that event, or they actually don't believe their military can fight and win. Uh, and leaders really, you know, they want to have the sharpest tools in their kind of geopolitical toolkit. And I think for the reasons we talked about with respect to military reforms, this kind of decade of laxity of discipline in the PLA under Hu Jintao, which led right, two vice chairmen of the CMC, Shu Tsai, Helen Bulbashong, to be 
um, it, you know, it, it charged with violating party discipline and, and you know, persecuted uh, on those grounds, although one of them died before uh, the trial was brought to conclusion, right? Well, this was not a military that was be, kind of ready to fight and win, uh, especially if that, that fight would involve the United States, it would be a high intensity, you know, military conflict, right? So India is one adversary for China, the United States is a very different kind of adversary. And so, I see China uh, basically, you know, waving a big stick with a lot of this rhetoric. It doesn't mean that the situation couldn't evolve in the future, depending upon choices in Taipei and choices in Washington, as well as choices in Beijing that kind of create this negative spiral, um, uh, as it were, whereby, um, you know, the mainland puts more pressure on Taiwan. Taiwan, you know, Taiwan seeks greater aid uh, from other countries, including the United States, which either looks like or ultimately maybe evolved into some change in the US policy towards one China, which China then views as crossing the red line and, and thus be begins thinking about using military force in a very uh, different way. The last thing I would say is historically, right? I, I've studied China's kind of national security and foreign policy making you know, much more in the past than the present, I mean, the present is always changing. But if we look at how China thinks about force historically, it's very rarely tried to use military force what Thomas Shelley would call brute force, right? Just taking what you want and solving um, the conflict that way. Instead, it uses force, right, as a as a in instrument of coercion to bring about some kind of other political objective that it seeks. And this would, you know, even include the border war with India, uh, the invasion of Vietnam, right? We've just had the 40th anniversary of the invasion of Vietnam. It wasn't about taking Vietnamese territory, but signaling to Vietnam and to Moscow, sort of certain Chinese red lines. And so, um, that simply says there is a tradition in China that uh, force is used right, to exert these politically coercive effects uh, rather than to bring about brute force solutions to problems. Finally, I would say that if one thinks about the highest intensity operation with respect to Taiwan, I am not sure that um, the PLA would have much confidence yet in its being able to successfully execute it. And of course, the worst outcome would be to try and fail. Um, uh, in such an endeavor. And so I, I think there is a pretty strong element of caution uh, in that sense, not, not in terms of using kind of military power coercively, as I mentioned before, but really in this brute force way to say, okay, we're just like Taiwan, you know, you can't stall forever. We're just gonna go and solve this by basically taking taking your island by force. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty complicated and, 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 and sophisticated military operation. It's not, not nearly as easy as it might sound, despite the proximity of Taiwan to China, right? There's just a lot, of, it's just crossing water with military forces is, is significant. <laughs> right, right. It doesn't, it doesn't happen very often for a reason, right? Right, uh, there is a reason that D-Day was a huge operation, right? Um, and, and people tend to underappreciate that, right? I mean, the Taiwan Strait is six times wider than the English Channel, right? So you're talking, and the, the shoals on the eastern face, or the, sorry, the western face of Taiwan are largely muddy. There's not a lot of ground that you can easily, you know, there's not clean beaches right. to gain purchase on, et cetera. So it is quite challenging. If that was untrue, if there was a path that allowed for a relatively quick and easy annexation of Taiwan with relatively low bloodshed, what would your reaction be then? So I think China always views these decisions, right, as the you know, a simple cost-benefit calculus. So what's the benefit? In this case, it's huge, uh -huh. right? It's it's bringing about unification, which is a long-standing nationalist objective for the party, but it's a nationalist objective from their standpoint, not a socialist objective. Mm -hmm. um, so if the costs were quite low, then yeah, the temptation would be would be quite high. Um, there still are questions as to how they would want to do that and then how they would assess the cost. Um, but if, I don't know, like if, say Taiwan was actually, um, you know, half of Burma, no. uh, you, know, you, know, you know, in other words, a, a massive land that shared a land border over which, you know, the projection of military power was not nearly as complicated. So maybe Russia and Crimea is a good example here. Um, no. There are ways in which you can, in some ways, uh, execute a fait accompli almost, uh, even on, on a large scale. But I think even now, right, the, there, there are still uh, costs that China has to take into account with respect to the United States. And I, I, the question would be how low would those costs 
or how far would those costs fall if 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 the the more narrow military costs were much lower, right? I mean, it would still elicit a, a pretty significant U.S. reaction. Um, I, it could be the event, right? That what do you think the U.S. reaction would be in that situation? So so let's let's pretend it's Crimea, and mm-hmm. China is able to take Taiwan in 36 hours. Yeah. Does the U.S. Truly respond? Do we decide to sever diplomatic relations? Do we insist on the return of something that's now under their control? Do we um, blockade Taiwan? Do, you know, like, is, what do we do? What's our response function in your assessment? I don't. I don't know what we would do because, if, for all the reasons you just noted, it, it like it, it puts the U.S. in a terribly tough position, right? Because if the fait accompli is successful, um, you have to pay a much higher price to reverse it. Because then you have to say, okay, I'm going to, you know, I, I, it may not be a general war with China, but it's certainly going to be a very major war if you wanted to try to reverse that by force. Mm-hmm. Of course, if, if you try to reverse that by means uh, below the threshold of using force through diplomacy and sanctions, um, you know, I, I'm pretty sure China would be willing to kind of ride out those costs uh, because of uh, the sheer importance of achieving the objective. And, you know, we even saw this on the border with India recently. Um, you know, you know, China made this move on the north bank of Pongol Lake and occupied, um, you know, an area maybe 40 to 60 square kilometers. You had the Bayek clash uh, in, in another location nearby and then calls for disengagement to which uh, China wanted there to be a military disengagement, but it didn't want to have to move its troops back, right? It kind of wanted to have its fate accompli and eat right. it too. Uh, yeah. India ponders this for a while and then says, well, we could seize these uh, mountain ranges on the southern bank of the lake that allow us to dominate some Chinese positions, and all in which they did. And all and they even called it a QPQ operation, a quid pro quo operation. Yep. Uh, and now that suddenly they had leverage um, yep. to bring yep. about the change they wanted. Yep. Um, and so they were able to reverse the fait accompli without resorting to force. It is not clear in this scenario what the what the countervailing leverage the U.S. and other states might be able to gain, just because Taiwan is right, so big, um, um, but it would certainly, you know, it would certainly lock, I think, the U.S. and China into a in much, much more competitive relationship than we have today. I mean, it's competitive today, but it's not kind of reached this breaking point um, whereby you really are in, you know some kind of two block competition and you're going to really decouple, right? I mean, like sever the cord uh, across the board. There would be pressure to do that. And it may be that for the U.S., the cost of doing so whenever this you know scenario plays out is, is too high and it doesn't go that far. Um, but I, I don't think that's where we are today, right? I mean, uh, um, China doesn't have quick, relatively cheap options militarily. Um, you know, you know, people talk about a blockade. Um, blockades take a long time, right? Uh, and you have to keep at them. And you know, they're also acts of war, but it gives other countries a chance to mobilize. Um, and would China really stop, be able to stop every other country from resupplying Taiwan? Uh, certainly, that'd be a very risky situation um, uh, to do that. And I suspect, you know, countries would try to break the blockade and. You know, Japan and the U.S. would have ways of, of doing that. Um, people talk about you know, very limited campaigns to signal, again, these are you know, politically co- military campaigns with political coercive goals. So seizing Pratas Island, which is sort of in the South China Sea, may, maybe seize, seizing Jinmen or Mazi, which are islands right off the coast of uh, sort of Fujian and Yep. Uh, Zhejiang. Um, but it, you know, one challenge there is then what happens, right? Uh, you probably would see increased U.S. support for Taiwan um, as well under those uh, circumstances. And so I think you see China, you know, obviously talking a very tough game, uh, continuing to, to develop military power in this coercive way. But I think it also, if it's assessing these costs uh, of different options it has, I think it's probably concluded it doesn't have an option that's good enough. And it is not the case that time is indefinitely on China's side, but certainly right, as China's economy continues to grow, right, this does increase its uh, other forms of leverage over Taiwan um, and even perhaps even over other countries in the region such that it might be able to uh, sort of divide any kind of coalition that might try to come to uh, Taiwan's uh, defense in the future. And so I think from China's point of view, they are uh, satisfied with the status quo such that 
Taiwan isn't obviously moving towards formal independence in any way, even if it isn't moving closer towards unification, because the just kind of uneven rates of economic growth are, are so clearly in China's favor that another 10 or 20 years of, of closer economic integration. Um, and you know, Taiwan has its own population challenges. I believe the birth rate there is the lowest in Asia, maybe. Um, you know, it's not. I think it's actually slightly higher than China, particularly the, the municipal areas of China. But, but yes, it is extraordinarily yeah. low. Yeah. I, I do think that actually opens up an interesting angle, which is this question of um, if not now, when, right? And one of the concerns that I would highlight is that as the U.S. is now, the Biden administration just announced a program for detangling of U.S. supply chains um, from China, right? A disentangling, to be more accurate. TSMC is talking about building next-gen fab equipment, fa you know, fabrication facilities for semiconductors in Texas and other areas, right? Um, good luck with the stability of power, apparently, in Texas. But, um, you know, regardless, uh, that is underway. Those don't become effective for a couple of years. But once they're effective, then China has much less ability to effectively exploit its role in our supply chain to force an acceptance, right? It becomes easier to blockade Taiwan. It becomes easier to blockade China for the U.S. because we're not reliant on China nearly as much from the supply chains, assuming we're successful in disentangling. And so I'm a little concerned that if I'm looking at this from China's perspective, you're very near the point of maximum influence and waiting diminishes that. The, the second thing that I would highlight, and this is an internal component within China, is one of the things we heard a lot in 2020, particularly in the earlier parts of 2020 before it was kind of tamped down, was the idea that the, um, uh, the components of the coronavirus um, plague was a, or pandemic, I'm sorry, was a, um, an indication that Xi had lost the mandate of heaven. How, how does that fit? I mean, if, I assume you've heard similar statements and, and observations. With Xi coming up for effectively, while well, he has power for life, right? He, he Every six years, I believe it is, he faces kind of a assessment of his leadership, right? That's next year. I'm wondering if there's an incentive to reclaim the mandate of heaven. That, that may override other issues. So the China scholar in me says mandate of heaven, right, has almost kind of become a trope, right? It doesn't have yeah. the, the, the- um, Not quite the same thing as the 19th century, but yes. I, right, it's not the same thing, um, but the question is a good one, right? Has, has, has Xi's standing been weakened enough such that he can't garner support to continue to rule? Um, or would need to do something to significantly elevate his support. As far as I can tell, um, although I, it, it is hard to tell on the outside, right? I think anyone who tells you what's going on in the Public Bureau Standing Committee in China doesn't like know what's going on in the public. Like, Why they're sharing it with us would be absurd, but yes, I agree. We have that. to be very humble, like I, you know, what we do and do not know. And I think we yeah. sometimes know, you know, we talk about knowing more than we do. But if, if, if one looks at how China is discussing 2020, right, um, it, it obviously the propaganda apparatus is completely reframing what happened into a great victory, mm -hmm. um, right? So China is the first to defeat the virus. And this is not just messaging to the outside, it's actually very critical messaging to the inside. Moreover, China was able to, you know, reopen and, and you know, the only major economy, I think, right, to, at least in their accounting, to have positive growth, uh, you know, over this 12 month period. And so um, that is clearly designed uh, on the one hand to signal that China did defeat the virus uh, internally, but also right, this is all being attributed uh, to Xi, right? So these are all his accomplishments, whether or not, you know, in fact, that that is the case. And so I think to the degree that people were um, uh, increasingly dissatisfied, and we really can't measure dissatisfaction because people can't voice it in China. Uh, and, and to the degree right, that February, March was a moment, I think that pro it appears that that would have passed, right? Um, and, and China now is really focused on um, moving into this new phase of celebration. So 2021, right, is the centennial of the founding of the Chinese uh, Communist Party. 
And so we're going to hear, you know, in the next 12 months, just unrelenting, uh, you know, stream of, of propaganda and stories about what has been accomplished in, in this uh, time frame. And a lot of that will, you know, be perhaps framed around Xi Jinping. There's a very interesting article yesterday, the day before yesterday, the People's Daily, the main, you know, newspaper of the, of the Communist Party uh, on the eradication of poverty in China, which is a big deal, right, from a human security perspective, but then attributing most of that to Xi Jinping, uh, or like it was, it's eradication happening on Xi's watch, setting aside the fact that, you know, Mao made China much poorer than otherwise would have been through right. disastrous policies and famine and dung, you know, led, you know, perhaps led China out of that, you know, nadir that Mao had put the country in and, you know, John and other leaders contributed to its growth, right? But this is all somehow being uh, sort of portrayed as uh, Xi's own accomplishment. Um, so I think if 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 there are real policy setbacks in China, say, um, um, you know, real decline in the economy, um, maybe something akin to what we saw with the equity markets in that 2015-16 timeframe, but maybe more consequential. And, and that was sustained over a period of time. That would be a real challenge for Xi, who, you know, uh, at this point looks like he will be reelected um, as general secretary of the next party Congress, because all right, he's just he's got a lock. Um, who else are you, you going to put in? But uh, um, no one, no one will openly oppose him because that's political suicide in China. Um, not, not, not <laughs> political suicide. That's suicide. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's, let's call a spade a spade. Um, and so it needs to be like, like it needs to be like a sustained domestic policy crisis, right? That would, I think, then become a, a point, a rallying point or a point of mobilization for a change in the political leadership. And you know, if, you know, quite frankly, right, if China had experienced what the U.S. has experienced with the virus, um, that, you know, 12 months of, of, you know, multiple waves and, you know, really significant deaths that are directly or indirectly attributable to the virus. That that could have been something right in China that would have really shaken uh, people's faith in the party, but it, it that's not, you know, sort of how the situation played out. And I think now we're in a situation where China feels, on the one hand, in a pretty good place because the economy is growing, even if it's not a very robust basis of growth, but they might feel feel, you know, much better than they felt, you know, in April, um, looking at, at the balance sheet. Um, and then compared to, compared to other major powers in the world, China looks like it's uh, fared, uh, fared pretty well. And that then boosts uh, Xi's own position uh, or just sort of up, you know, sort of bolsters his position at home. Um, but it's a really good question. It's, it's, it, I think it has to be a much, you know, much bigger crisis than what, what we actually saw. And even if there were hints of, of of dissatisfaction um, for a period of time, it, 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 the party, you know, it, you know, the, what the what the what the CCP can do, right, is mobilize. Uh, this goes back to its revolutionary roots, and it really mobilized uh, in the face of the virus in a way that um, many or most societies could not do. Which is not to say that China's approach to the virus was the only approach. We have to look at other places like Taiwan. South Korea, right, Singapore, that took very different approaches that were very successful. So this is not at all an endorsement, clear, right? Glorifying this approach, it's something to say, right? What what the CCP can do right, historically, right, is to mobilize society around different objectives, and it did mobilize with respect to the virus in different ways, um, which was kind of how it would respond in a policy sense, and it was was successful and thus to Xi's benefit in the end. Got it. Well, listen, you have been extraordinarily generous with your time. I would, um, you have a book that came out a couple of years ago that I would encourage people who are interested in the dynamics of, you know, in particular Asian security issues. It, it came out actually earlier this year, right? Is that, or was it last year? Well, it's, it's COVID time. So it came out in actually April of 2019. Perfect. Uh, okay. And it's now available on paperback as of December. So, okay. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, um, and the title of your book is Active Defense China's Military Strategy Since 1949. Fantastic. And we'll, um, I'd, I'd like us to provide a link to either Amazon or, or something else so that people can take a look at that if they're interested in exploring this further. Taylor, you've always pushed my thinking on China. You've been a great sounding board. And I appreciate you coming on to Real Vision to share that with everybody else. Um, 
I would love to try to make this a more regular discussion, particularly as we've got a number of events coming up, among other things you mentioned, the centennial of the Chinese Communist Party, the potential developments around Taiwan. Um, I'd love to walk you through some of the stuff that I've I've done on that offline. Yeah. Um, but um, if we can arrange to have you come back again and, and uh, have kind of a regular feature of these types of discussions, I would love that if you'd be willing to do so. I'd be delighted to be able to hang out with you is always always a real treat. So um, I just I just wish we could actually do it in person. <laughs> I know that's the thing that keeps killing me. I wish we could do it in person. I feel like I want to shake like uh, the Loma Prieta earthquake to try to straighten, straighten the world out. Yes. Um, I look forward to the opportunity to get out to Boston and come see or more accurately Cambridge, come out and see you soon. And uh, yeah. we, we, we can sit down and grab a drink. Taylor, thank you so much. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.